everyone and welcome to another Scots Way podcast and I'm joined today by writer Phil Miller to talk about his new novel The Hollow Tree which is the second of the Shona Sanderson series of novels about to be published by Polygon later this year in April I believe. Hello That's Phil. Right. Hello thanks for having me on. I'm right about that it's April isn't it that it's coming That's out? Right. Yes first week in April it's published in UK and in the US as well. Oh fantastic. And before we get stuck into the Hollow Tree, can I ask you about opening lines? Because there's a few in this. I wonder if you put, you know, you great set by them, because I'll I'll mention a couple, and then there's one which I, I don't think even I can mention on my own podcast. But the very opening day is Shona Sanderson was going to a wedding. The day would end in death, which is fantastic as an opening sentence. And then the other one, I, I jumped forward to chapter seven, and it was the morning after the orgy which is another one. So are you thinking about how can I grab readers time and time again? Yeah, I think so. I think there's an element of that. I think also when you're writing, um, Alistair, uh, as you know, like a, like a lot of writers, I have a full-time job. Um, so when I'm finally sitting down at the end of the day to write, there's an element of grabbing your own attention as well, uh, especially when you've just been rev revisiting what you wrote the day before or the week before um but yeah i think um yeah it comes from trying to uh grab the reader's attention especially if you've if i i've written the previous chapter is quite lyrical or slow or, or poetic and i can hear the the reader or the or the editor's voice phil get on with it um so so i i, I um i i do that um, also, it resets the scene sometimes. Mm. Uh, for example, you mentioned the orgy there. Um, it's a switch of scene, isn't it? Um, but yeah, there's an element of the dramatic about it as well. I wrote, uh, I write poetry as well, mm -hmm. Alistair, where um, I think there's an element of trying to condense a lot into one line there maybe as well. Yeah. Uh, but opening lines of books are important to me, yes. So uh, The Blue Horse, my very first book, um, was... Uh, George Newhouse was in love with his wife, but his wife was dead. So oh. I, I kind of started with that. Um, uh, and yeah, I'm, gl I'm glad it grabbed you. It does, the, word, it, sorry. the word orgy always grabs attention, doesn't it? It does, as does the beginning of chapter 18, which I won't mention. People can find that out for themselves. <laughs> uh, um, but it felt to me that the opening line, a bit like the one you've just mentioned as well, it's almost like it really sets it up that people want to know more. You say, like, Shona Sanderson's in it, she's at a wedding, and there's going to be a death. You know, bang, you're in. You're in straight away to the novel. I wonder as well, um, obviously, my I was a journalist for 20 years mm. um, for papers in Scotland, and the craft of journalism is grabbing the attention sometimes. Yeah. Um, uh, so it may play into that kind of theme. Shona is a journalist, after all. Yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I hope so anyway, I hope it grows. Oh, yeah, no, it does. And I think, I haven't thought about that, but as you're reading through it almost, you know, you've, you've been through a scene which can be quite complex and different characters and then bang, you can hit, like, run into the next one as well, which is a really <laughs> interesting way of looking at it. And perhaps we should talk about the Golden Acre first was the first Shona Sanderson novel, although we might mention it wasn't quite the first one in, in a mm -hmm. moment. But why did you want to write that um, novel? Why did you want to write The Golden Acre? That came from, I think The Golden Acre was born out of a little kind of difficult time in my writing life um, where my previous publisher had gone bust, um, Freight, um, where I'd written a, a novel that didn't get picked up, you know, that I'd spent two years writing and just didn't get anywhere. And I think I had a, a hard think about uh, what novel I wanted to write next and I wanted to write for me anyway a straightforward uh, kind of uh, thriller like the kind of ones I, I read uh, when I was younger that my father would read that my mother reads that my wife reads and I've been doing a lot of reading of thrillers um, so the Meg Gray books and Martin Beck and of course the great one Scottish you know Ian Rankin and Denise Mina and uh, Louise Welsh, I should mention as well, and um, and uh, David Peace's novels. So I thought I would have a go at doing one of 
you know, trying to write in that genre. And um, I was I was worried about writing in a genre a little bit because my yeah. two first books were, I suppose, more literary fiction. Um, but I was I was kind of comforted by, you know, reading someone like Raymond Chandler, um, uh, who who wrote beautifully within a genre. And Ursula Le Guin had a, a I think it was in a speech or she was she was giving was talking about genre and about how genre is a is more of a setting. It's not a set of rules. Yeah. Um, and obviously she wrote fantasy novels. Um, uh, so all that went into the thinking of the Golden Acre. And obviously the Golden Acre revolves around identity and fraudulent identity without spoiling it for readers who haven't read it yet. There, the Golden Acre is a painting that may or may not be what it seems to be. And the two main characters, Thomas Tallis, the art expert, um, and Shona Sanson are not quite maybe what they appear to be as well. In fact, most of the characters in the Golden Acre are multi, multi, multi-sided, multi-dimensional, and there is a, a series of lies at the centre of that book as well. Um, and, you know, you could say as well that the grander themes of that book uh, is about deception. Um, so, yeah, I wrote it... Um, I got. I was very lucky. I wrote. I, I won the Robert Louis Stevenson Fellowship, so I was given a little bit of time outside my work and, and family life to sit down and write that book. Um, and I was really pleased with how it turned out. Um, and Shona kind of came back to me because, as you mentioned, she was in a previous book of mine, yeah. but I really wanted more of her. Um, I could. I could hear her. I could almost see her and. I needed a journalist for the Golden Acre, and she she was she was there. She was kind of knocking on the door, wanting the story herself. So that's so she'd that's stayed with you. Had she as a character, she'd stayed because I often ask writers, you know, once they finish a book, they do often say, "Well, characters can stay with you." People that you yeah. spent so much time on was that the case with Shona? You know, this isn't finished. Yeah, absolutely. I had um, I had journalists in my other books, but in All the Galaxies, my second book. Um, which is set in a slightly future Glasgow. She's a junior reporter who ends up becoming quite a, a badly injured uh, on chasing a story. And as I was writing all the galaxies, I was I was realizing I was having much more fun writing Shona than I was some of the other ma allegedly main characters in the book. She's she, you know she's very um, as anyone who's read the Golden Acre uh, will know. She's uh, very sharp-minded, sharp-witted, Glaswegian, hard-driving, slightly obsessive. Uh, she walks with a stick because of her injuries. Um, and um, from working in Scottish journalism for 20-something years, I felt I kind of knew her. She, yeah. she just kind of emerged in my mind. And um, I took the liberty of kind of taking her uh, forward in my, in my books as well and I, I really enjoy writing about her and with her there's a lot of un un uh, kind of written history to Shona as well there's I think there's more there to be discovered about her and obviously there was something else as well about her that I knew she lived with her father I don't know why but she lived with her elderly father and looked after him and this is a really key part of her character she's a caregiver as well as being this obsessive journalist there's multiple sides to her and that's that's a big part of the hollow tree yes. that relationship um, right from the beginning. Um, but just briefly on the Golden Acre, it's interesting to hear you say that you were kind of inspired by the thrillers that you read, but your father read and your mother read. Because mm -hmm. to me, it felt um, not old, very different from what we maybe think of as or no now Scottish crime fiction is really wide, especially now. You know, it covers yeah. all sort of historical and all sorts of things. But this felt like a kind of classic almost noir, Le Carrie, you know, that kind of style of writing done in, and it even made Edinburgh seem different, which I thought I'd read how Edinburgh was, you know, but it, mm. just the way that it was described, um, a, you know, the the skyline and the, the sunsets and all of those things, I think perhaps that links into the art, which is the, the book is about as well. Did you set out to do all of those things to write something that wasn't 
It's typically perhaps a tartan noir, for want of a better term. Um, I think so. I think it's. I think there's two sides to that. There's one. It's just the way I write. Um, mm -hmm. and I think the Golden Acre was probably the most condensed and, um, you know, focused of the books I'd written. Uh, to make the plot run along. Um, so I do. I do write like that. I write poetry and publish poetry. I think that plays into it as well. I think you're right. I, I think you in your review, your very kind review, you mentioned Graham Greene and John Le Carre, and I mean, I've read those obsessively. Um, so that I, I, you know, who knows how influence works. Um, but yeah, I, I also I was aware that Edinburgh's been written about so many times yeah. uh, by, you know, and by better pure crime writers than me so you know I can't I have to write it the way I see it yeah uh, the way I experience it and Edinburgh um who was it was it Stevenson said Edinburgh is a dream in stone you know Edinburgh is a extraordinary place mm -hmm. um, which has its shadows and its beauty as well um and I think the golden acre was an attempt to kind of grasp it in that in that way um and that's also how I write. So, um, yeah, and I, I wanted to continue that into the next book as well. It's, well, a city, it's a city, I think, that almost perfect for crime of all sorts, you know, whether it's high end and, you know, mm. wealth and all that. And then you've got the, the um, I've been listening to the um, McCleavy stories on, on the radio, you know, back historical, uh, down in the, the wines of Leith and all that. It's a city that has the capacity for all sorts of crime, which I think almost feeds into the Golden Acre. Yeah, and I think as well, um, the Golden Acre is seen from the view of Thomas Tallis, who's who's from London, uh, who's, who's English anyway. So he's come to Edinburgh for the first time, really. So uh, I very much when I moved to Edinburgh from the north of England, you do get overwhelmed sometimes by the vistas, you know, maybe the sun setting or on a beautiful sunny day. You know, you just think, what is this city with a castle on a mountain in the middle and a and a and a kind of the rock that Arthur's seat sticking out of the city, you know, and there's this there's a seashore as well. There's this extraordinary Georgian splendor. There's the remnants of the old town. Um, it is an extraordinary place. And and even though I've been back living here now for eight years after living in Glasgow for 20, um, it still sometimes takes the breath away a little bit. Um, it is. It is an extraordinary city. Um, so I think that was playing into it as well. Um, this rediscovery of the city that I went to university because I went to university here to study uh, to study history. So there's an element of the rediscovery of the city as well, I think. I, I agree. I, whenever I come through from Glasgow, I never take it for granted. It is a stunning uh, place. Absolutely. Yeah. So how do you approach writing a sequel? You've had The Golden Acre. It's been well thought of and reviewed and all of those things did you have the hollow tree in mind or was it did you have to kind of start afresh mm, that's a very good question I mean obviously the golden acre um was the start I suppose of Shona Sanderson books but obviously it'd be you know it was my third book and I'd, I'd worked through some other themes and characters in those uh previous books um but yeah I knew I did. I did have a story in mind, actually, uh, almost straight away, because when I started writing in um, this shows how long writing takes. But when I did a first draft of my first novel, inverted commas, in 1999, 2000, uh, and showed it to the uh, the late Giles Gordon, R.I.P., um, it was called uh, well, it was called the the diary of lies which is going to be my next book but it had this plot about centering around uh the uh ouija board messages and secrets of a group of teenagers many years later so um i did have that plot but i i set it to one side for a long time and so it seemed right now to come back back to this story so um yeah i did have it i, I wouldn't say i had it ready uh but i had had it was it was in there in my mind, for sure. Uh, and so I have to tell you, I, I've read it. I loved it. It really surprised me, but in a really good way. I'll say that to you because it's it's almost 
a horror as much as it is crime, or at least there are overtones. You know, you've got small community, childhood secrets. Um, you mentioned the Ouija board, the occult. I, it was weirder than I was expecting, Phil, <laughs> which is great. Was that something, I guess if you, you had in your mind a kind of story that you wanted to go down, were these areas that you kind of wanted to explore? Yes, um, thank you for that. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, it is it is weirder, yeah. Um, I'd always, I mean, Ouija boards, is, you know, I was born in 73, so um, when I was a teenager, there was no internet. There was no multiple channels. You know, I grew up in the 80s and 90s. And I think anyone who's grown up in a small town anywhere in the UK or perhaps in Europe mm. has heard of teenagers trying to use Ouija boards or messing around with them or drunkenly, you know, engaging with them in some way. And I always thought they were interesting because it's all about uh, messages and writing. And even if it is just... Uh, your fellow Ouija board uh, people kind of pushing it around to give each other messages still involves, it involves writing and letters, whether, and if it's from the beyond, if you really believe in them, I'm not sure I do, um, then uh, what a strange way for the dead to uh, to talk to us <laughs> through, uh, you know, a board with letters written on it. And, I, and then uh, I'd read the Don DeLeo book, The Names, which is, I guess, his version of a thriller mm -hmm. um, uh, set in Greece, which is all around this cult that's killing people because, because of their use of language or through the use of language. And it really struck me and it really reignited my own uh, idea I had for this. Uh, and I thought, why not try that again? But as for the, the horror element... I'm not sure it's pure horror. There's, no, there's, no. there's no monsters, so to speak, apart from human ones. But um, it does it does border on that kind of, I would say, kind of liminal space between uh, what what you feel may be happening and what what is actually happening. I think we've all had moments in our lives where a shiver runs down our back, right? It's something weird. You see something out the corner of your eye. Something odd happens. Deja vu is common to everybody and i wanted to tap into that feeling of the uncanny i suppose in the old sense yeah uh, and the weird and I'd, I'd done a lot of reading around all that too um the weird and the eerie as mark fisher called it um so um i'd be interested to know how it made you feel when you because some of it is a bit creepy i mean well, I was thinking of two of my favourite films, uh, Wicker Man and, and Don't Look Now. There's no monsters in them, but they are considered, mm. particularly the Wicker Man, horror. And it had that, and maybe partly because you've also got the small town with yeah. secrets and, you know, the outsiders coming in is often looked on suspiciously and all those things. So I kind of got that feel about it. You're right, the monsters are undoubtedly human. But there is the kind of, question over um yeah I'm, I'm going to talk about and not give anything away if you feel i do give anything away just let me know <laughs> but you know the the, the kind of the, the writing on people and there was this idea that something that you're right i was similar age to yourself a little bit older but that kind of teenage years of people heading to cemeteries and pushing things around we mm. you know that kind of and spooking each other out it's a jump from that to have adults still obsessing yes. over these things so that in itself kind of gave me a bit of it unsettled me maybe that's the best way to put it it really unsettled me at times yeah it is unset yes well i'm glad in a way i'm glad but you know it is it is unsettling uh, as you say without giving too much away what this group of friends were doing when they were teens in 1992 still resonates today so those messages that this Ouija board was giving them means different things to them. Um, so there's a set of phrases that their Ouija board kept repeating over and over again. And they're all different characters, very different people, of course, but it's meant different things to them in the intervening years. So when Shona kind of stumbles into their world via that wedding uh, mm -hmm. that you mentioned, um, they have been living with this for 30 years. Yeah. And these phrases from the Ouija board mean different things to them. 
um, some quite dramatically different. Um, so she's trying to really work out what what the hell happened back then and what what does it mean now and whether she can prize apart this this real kind of puzzle that's been locked to the outside world for all that time because uh, there is a reluctance right across from anyone involved or related to kind of let her in and maybe they're yeah. not even sure of what's going on I, it's the two, two writers that i thought about one was stephen king who does that he often goes back to you know bonds formed in childhood Mm -hmm. that then, you know, affect later life. And Ian Banks being the, the, the other one, and I felt that particularly Banks, there was a, maybe a, a side influence there going on. I mean, did you have other writers in mind when you were writing it, or this was just your own? I was... Um, it's interesting you mentioned Stephen King. I hadn't thought of that. But yes, you're right. I think, I think he does do that, doesn't he? He does go back. Um, I was uh, Ian Banks is always an influence. I just love I I love Ian Banks sci-fi fiction. Yeah, yeah. Uh, intensely. Um uh this book is not sci-fi of course, but just his his way of spinning ideas out and and plots uh, and uh he's just well, he was one of our great writers, wasn't he? Absolutely. But um uh I wasn't yeah, yeah, I was I was thinking of you know maybe Shirley Hazard and uh, maybe potentially Robert Aikman and I suppose there's always Lovecraft in a way in the background there but no I wasn't I wasn't do you know I was thinking about The Dark is Rising by Susan Cooper a lot yeah. because that was a really that had a huge impact on me when I was a child um, and I know it's kind of undergone a bit of a renaissance but for many years no one was talking about that book um, but I was, um, you know, I was a not a slow reader, but I I was really just reading the music magazines and comics until you know, relatively late. But when I read uh, the Dark is Rising, and I read it out of sequence, it 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 completely blew you know it really blew my mind. And that is a deeply unsettling book at times. Um, she writes about light and dark and. Um, the eeriness and and about rural eeriness um so well um and it had a huge impact on me so that that would always be in the background and i think as well it'd be remiss not to mention alan garner um and uh, especially elidor and um some of his other works as well the way uh and the owl service particularly just that way of making you know uh commonplace things and uh items and actions in a certain setting cast in a certain different light an uncanny light can really change your whole perception of things yeah. um so they were don't get me wrong they weren't beside me as i was writing but they were certainly there in the background i think with this as well also i grew up in a northern town in the countryside like this setting um but Importantly, Shona didn't. She's a Glasgow girl. She's yeah. urban. Got you know. She holds no truck with any of that nonsense. Basically, um, you know, she's she she doesn't believe in ghosts. She doesn't believe in the afterlife. She um, she is a a modernist, uh, and uh, so her interaction with this uh, other world is tense. Is, is there's a tension there? As uh, someone who is very much Glasgow born and or not born but raised anyway, yeah, um, and that's the kind of I was on her side in that sense. Is like you think I don't belong here, and in a city you kind of can go anywhere and belong, you know, because that's yeah. the nature of it. But in a small place where everyone knows each other and maybe knows things about each other, it's quite difficult. And that you get that across very very well. I was going to ask you why you set it where you did, but you just explained that it's it's a place you know or a kind of type of place you know well yeah it's not the town I grew up in um but it's uh I would say parallel you know and the geography of of Ullathorne the town in uh the book is very similar to the town I grew up in which is Barnard Castle um so there's a castle there's a river most importantly um there's woods 
There's kind of primeval woods that have never been touched still in the Pennines, um, and it's isolated. So, and I knew all that very well. You know, I know my hometown reasonably well. Um, so, again, there's also a bit of kind of writer's economy there as well, Alistair, because I've got a full time job. I don't have a lot of time for research. You know, I'd love to have set it in Tashkent or, you know, Madrid or San Francisco, but I can't go there. Whereas I know my, I know the North, that, that, that kind of North, because there are many Norths, uh, pretty well. Um, so, so, and I wanted Shona to be out of her comfort zone as well. Yeah. Um, out of Edinburgh, out of Glasgow, somewhere she feels really uncomfortable and she doesn't drive either. So, um, she has to be driven around by a photographer, which uh, irritates her immensely. Um, but obviously in the, in a rural setting, you have to get around by car. And that becomes a fantastic relationship as well. Like that kind of double act, if you like, between her yeah. and, and Terry. And and it's it's t- talked about it being unsettling, but it's unsettling in a, in a number of ways. One being how things that happen in your youth or childhood can really affect later yeah. on because there's a lot of damaged people here. Yes. I think as I get older, um, I realize how, as you get older, you realize how important your childhood was. Yeah. Even more. I think there's a temptation, well, I certainly, in my 20s, to just forget, you know, not really forget about your childhood, but, you know, you're always moving on, you're young, you're, you want to do new things, make your own life, whatever. Um, and as you get older, you realize how important your formative years are. And I think, I mean, it's a truism, but obviously your teenage years in, you know, your years just before you leave home, I suppose, yeah, can be absolutely crucial. And I think we all know people in our lives who you kind of think, what happened to them? Like he was my mate and he's just disappeared off the face of the earth or what happened to her or, or um, I wonder what, you know, happened yeah. to that, that intelligent, funny guy or that brilliant guy girl you know that you knew at school yeah you lose track with them entirely um and in this case of this group of friends that shona is investigating basically um she finds the variety of human experience i think of yeah. and especially from that era i suppose from the 90s and the 2000s um the different ways people went or could go yeah um, and the way that people have gone is, is quite extreme. Um, I, I, we mentioned Ian Banks earlier on, and it kind of reminded me of complicity, which I think is Banks' angriest yeah. and perhaps most nihilistic novel. Um, because there are in the book, there are comments on politics and politicians, and they feel heartfelt. Would that be correct? Um, yes. I mean, they're always seen through characters, I suppose. Yeah. Um, so it's not yeah, through uh, actions rather than than statements. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was very careful not to make, not for the author's voice to be making political statements, but for characters. So as you say, so one of the one of the school friends becomes an MP, has become an MP. Um, so he is a, a very, I suppose, what we would now call populist MP, uh, railing against. Uh, I suppose, liberal or socialistic values. Um, and he's been very successful doing that, uh, which does is not unbelievable in this day and age when you look at the, new, the daily news. So um, I was very keen for one of the characters to have made it at Westminster. Um, so he's Gary in the book, Gary Watson, MP, and others have become business, business successful in business. Others have stayed at home. Others have you know, gone elsewhere and come back. Uh, and of course, one of their member, one of the members of this friendship group disappeared completely. Yeah. Um, and that's at the core of the book. What happened to what happened to Andy? Yeah. Um, and so it all it all leads back to that. Um, I think t- to answer your question, uh, not directly. Um, I, I, <laughs> I, he, Gary Watson certainly believes what he's saying. Yeah. Um, he also says things he knows will get him votes. So um, 
whatever he says, he says passionately. Whether he 100% believes in them or not, I don't, you know, I'll leave that up to the readers, maybe. But a, a bit like you were saying, you, you wanted, to, you know, not to have the author's voice. You have his words, but then you also have his deeds. And, yeah. you know, that which paints the character uh, really kind of specifically. Yes. And I'm interested in Shona is such a strong and standout character. I can totally understand why, you know, you think there's a big story, you know, going on there. But the supporting cast are also really memorable. How do you approach, how do you begin to put that, you know, other characters together? You've got your central character, you've got the story. Do they come from the story? Yeah, I think so. It's a good question, though. And uh, sometimes you do wonder where they come from. And sometimes it's best not to ask yourself too much. Do you know what I mean? It's like, where did Terry come from? This this very um, charming photographer who is a woman despite her name. So, um, and uh, endures working with Shona for a week, um, but is a, is, a, is a good journalist herself in her own self. Yeah. And that's definitely taken from my career in journalism where photographers, and especially when you're in a job out, in, out of the office, um, a key part you know absolutely vital to the journalistic trade um so i really i wanted a, a snapper to be in the book um and terry is that so um uh the other characters come out of the story i suppose so you have this group of friends i never want characters in my books to feel um like they are movable parts on the stage or just kind of faceless um uh it's something in books that puts me off myself when I'm reading a book and it's you can yeah. see someone's just being used yeah. um uh as a, a prop almost so I want also the reader to feel what these people are like to know what it's like to have met these people good bad or indifferent and also if any of them come to a sticky end for the reader to feel something for them you know not just to see it as uh yes another murder in a book but at least have a little glimpse into what's been lost or or why they've got to that stage yeah um yeah exactly so i feel it is a kind of a bit of a duty to make the characters as real as i can actually but oftentimes you you're writing a character and you wonder where it's from and then you you realize it is someone you've met or someone you know or right. some uh, when i was a journalist obviously i met a lot of people um but Bobby, for example, one of the characters, one of the friendship group, um, he he's joined the army and, you know, we all knew guys from our school who joined the army, you know, it's uh, but it's it's important to me that they are fleshed out people and not just not just ciphers on the page, I suppose. And you said that sometimes you're not sure where the characters may have come from. Do you ever read what you've written and go? Where has that come from? <laughs> you ever it's, kind of not shock yourself, but surprise yourself? Uh, I think it's as you're type in the actual action of typing, yeah. And I think, um, and and a few authors have said this over the over the years that it's more the surprise of the plot. You you suddenly write something, you go, oh, what? I didn't expect that to happen. It's it's very odd. It's hard to ex explain, but the plot takes a leftward turn or a rightward turn, and it certainly did with the Hollow Tree. Um, uh, I don't want to give too much away, but there's an oh. incident with an axe, which yes. just came out of the blue when I was writing it and left me a little bit of a quandary. Uh, but um, yeah, I love the incident with the axe, so I left it in. Uh, but uh, that's what happens. The plot surprises you. Yeah. That's interesting, yeah. And are there more in the series? Are there more to come from Shona Uh Yeah, well, the, I suppose the simple answer is yes. So um i've written another one so it's written okay um, and um we'll see when it appears yeah it's called the diary of lies and it it's it's shona as the main character again um there's no allotment drama in this one though right. um, you'll, <laughs> you'll know because there's a and there's a lot of allotment drama in the hollow tree um, but in yeah, in the diary of lies, she continues. It, it's 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 very much of its time. It's very post COVID, post Brexit. It's a political. It's more of a political thriller actually than than the Hollow Tree. Oh, that's interesting. The yeah. allotment remind me actually of a friend of mine was driving uh, 
musician, American musician in from Glasgow Airport, and they drove past allotments and she said, Oh, is that the, the poorer part of Glasgow? So no people <laughs> there, that's the that's where they go to grow their vegetables. Uh, <laughs> so allotments, uh, it's always a it's it, that's a strange world in itself, as you kind of you know, show when you're writing about it. You know, the yes, politics I, of allotments. Yeah, I, I love allotments. I mean, I just, I don't have one myself, but I love walking past them. I love that people take so much kind yeah. of care and joy in growing things in the middle of a city. I don't know. I, I, just, I just, there's a lot around here where I live in North Edinburgh, northern, north part of Edinburgh, uh, especially around Warriston, where uh, Shona's dad has his allotment. Um, and uh, very specifically. Um, and yeah, I, I, I got a lot of help from family members who do have allotments uh, about the uh, level of intensity of his allotment drama. Mm -hmm. So I know it's a, it's a subplot, but it's... Uh, yeah. And I think actually the scene where people come to help him clear his allotment was one of the first scenes I wrote for the book. It's, oh, yeah. it's quite an important part of the book to me. Yeah. Uh, that people would band together voluntarily to help somebody else. And I think it contrasts well with some of the more uh, vicious characters in the book. Yeah, I know, absolutely. And you mentioned that you've written novels, uh, your first two novels weren't necessarily Shona Sanderson novels per yes. se. Do you think you might do something different? Have you got any thoughts about doing something different again? Or is it you can... Yeah. Concentrating on these novels at the moment. You no, know, I've always got ideas. I think um, I, I'm enjoying writing Shona, and because she's a journalist, you know, she can stick her nose into anything, really. Yeah. You know what I mean, anything that makes a story. So for her, uh, and uh, you know, importantly, she's not obviously to be uh, interested in solving a crime or solving a mystery. But it's not her primary aim. Her primary aim is getting a story that can be printed, especially in the hollow tree where she's now a freelance yeah. um, because she got made redundant at the end of the Golden Acre. So so um, she's all about stories rather than justice, which is which is interesting. Um, and it means that but she can essentially write about anything as long as she thinks it's got a hook and can be printed. So. Um, yeah, I, I have some more ideas as well that may be a little bit left of centre for her. We'll see how they, sh uh, you know, how that works. Um, but yeah, my first two novels are a bit more literary and I don't think Shona was even born in the what happens in The Blue Horse, uh, my first book, because she's, uh, well, her age, hmm, I haven't nailed down her age, I've got to admit that, but she's younger than me for certain. Um, and as I say, she's in the second book, All the Galaxies, um, yeah. as a junior reporter. Yeah. And uh, here's an easy one to, to wind down with, Phil. Yes. You were our correspondent, you know, for a month, you know, Scotsman Herald, I think Sunday Times as well, you know, you yes. did yeah. trip there. How do you view the arts in Scotland at the moment? And on top of that, how do you view arts journalism, the state of that? Two Ooh. easy questions for you to, to get. Oh, through. man, yeah. they're very difficult. <laughs> yeah. Um, so well, I will say, first of all, I love being, you know, an arts correspondent. I was arts correspondent, I think, pr primarily for the Herald of 17 years there. Um, the arts in Scotland, I mean, like every sector is, you know, uh, deeply affected by austerity, deeply affected by the world we're living in now. And uh, it's no easier to be an artist or a writer as every year goes past. Mm. Um and it's a struggle. And I worry about when I, when I was young, you know, when I was at university, I was on a full grant. I was, uh, I had, I could claim unemployment benefit if I wanted to, if I'd wanted to be a musician, for example, or, you know, it was different times. And uh now I know it is a real struggle for people to work full time as artists to even contemplate it yeah. is uh, hard. I mean, how many writers write for a living? Oh, yeah, hardly any, really. Tiny percentage. Um, and uh, uh, and now, especially with accommodation, like people's homes and housings being so difficult, especially for young people, people are so 
worried about where they're living and where the next how they're going to feed themselves and all these things about this world we're living in at the moment mitigate against um people expressing themselves in an artistic way um so my children if they want to be artists they have it far harder than i had when i was their age yeah and that can't be right yeah um having said all that i think you know there are sport networks in scotland um and i know that from my journalism years who try their very hardest to 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 support artists um as far as arts journalism I think there's always a need for more arts journalism. And I say that as someone who's no longer a journalist and now I work as a civil servant. But I, when I was a journalist for the Herald and and, and the other uh, newspapers I worked for, I always treated the arts as seriously as if it was home news or education or health or crime. Now, obviously, health and education and crime, you know, are extremely important, vital part of our society. But... I always tried to cover the arts and culture as if it was as if it was as important yeah. uh, to get it on the news pages out of the back of the book and onto the front seven pages. That was always my aim. And I think that should be the aim now as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'd say about that. Well, Paul, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. I think the Hollow Tree is an excellent read, as was the Golden Acre. And I really can't wait to read what happens next. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on. It's an absolute pleasure. And we'll be back soon with someone completely different. Mm-hmm.